everybody, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this Global Leader Series event. It is, as you all know, focusing on the upcoming selection of the next Secretary General of the United Nations. IPI is uh, presenting all the official candidates for the post here at the Trigvili uh, Center. And our guest today is, of course, Susana Malcora, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Argentina. So we give her a big hand. Join me in welcoming her. Uh, I feel particularly privileged to be here because this is actually because of extensive travel. This is the only event which I will chair for all the candidates. So I hope, uh, Susanna, that that's a good omen. Um, so um, you have all um, who are present here in New York, uh, a full bi biogra biography in your papers. But for the sake of those of you who are following us via video, let me note briefly that in addition to the post I just mentioned, uh, Mrs. Makura has been the chef de cabinet for the UN Secretary General. Uh, she has been Under Secretary General for uh, field support, overseeing actually more than 120,000 military, civilian, and police personnel deployed around the globe. She has also been Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Executive Director of the World Food Program. And before entering international civil service, she also has a distinguished career in the private sector. She has been an executive at IBM and Telecom Argentina. As with the other candidates uh, who have appeared here, we have asked her to speak for 15 minutes, and then we will go directly to the questions and answering period. So please join me once again to welcome to IPI the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, Susana Marcura. And with these words, uh, Susana, uh, I will give you the floor. Let me start again now by saying good morning, everybody. Thank you, Terge, for given me the opportunity. I, I think we are all going through a very interesting exercise of a, a warmth control, see how far we can resist. And this reminds me of the race where I am engaged. It's also a resistance exercise. So I think this is a good trial here, and I'm happy to do it together with you all. Uh, now going to a more serious uh, discussion. I think uh, uh, having the chance to be with you and give you a sense of what is it that I see and why is it that I want to be the next Secretary General is a great opportunity. And many people ask me uh, why is it that I am trying to get to be the Secretary General. I always say that it's starting from my own family who wonder why I'm doing this. And the answer to that is very simple. It, I came into the UN some 12 years ago. And honestly, I came into the UN without fully grasping what the UN meant to the world. And being in World Food Program for almost four years gave me a sense of what is the UN for the people who really are in need. Then I came to New York to work in peacekeeping, and I had a totally different perspective, but again, got the sense of what the UN can do, what difference can it make for those who are in despair, for those who have no option, for those who lost everything. And in the end, for the last almost four years, I was the chair of the cabinet of the Secretary General, and from a totally different perspective there, very close to the heart of the decision making, I understood how the UN is positioning itself to deliver to those in need. And one of the things I discover is that often there is a big gap between the decision making here in the, this building across the street and the realities on the ground and the realities and demands of those that need so much these United Nations. 
there is a gap there that often the UN is not able to fill, that often the UN doesn't even see. And there is a sense of self-centered self views here across the street. And I felt very strongly that uh, if you add inspiration, if you add passion, if you add heart to what the UN is, there are, is a real chance to close that gap. And that's what I think I can do. People ask a lot of questions about many things, about reform, about procedural aspects. I deeply believe that what I can bring to the UN and what the UN needs is heart. It's going back to basics, to those principles of the Charter that we all felt last year when we celebrated the 70th anniversary, those principles remain as valid 70 years after as they were 70 years ago. So let's just go back to basics. Let's go to the heart of what the UN is. And let's inspire ourselves. Let's inspire our staff. And let's inspire member states to work in this multilateral setting with a sense of purpose. But that's the basic reason why I want to be the Secretary General. Now I will take you through a, some of the things that I have written in my vision statement. I'm sure some of you may have read it. I will try and summarize. But in the end, this is the real, real reason why I'm standing before you and I'm trying to make the case to the ones who are in the Security Council and hopefully be elected. And that's why I define my vision saying that I want a UN center in people and planet. Again, going back to the notion of those in need. And I've added planet because I think the notion of planet these days is essential to what people in need have but may not have soon because of the changes in the planet. I also said in my vision statement that I want a UN <coughs> driven by issues. And to me, this is absolutely central because I've seen a UN evolving more and more towards being what I will call organizationally centric, you know, being driven by how the UN is organized and based on that prepares its responses. I think one needs to turn that around and really have a UN that is centered on issues and based on those issues decide what responses to prepare. And the last thing I said in my vision statement is that I wanted a UN focus on impact. Because, again, once you define what is it that you need to do to really serve that, those people and that planet, once you understood the issue and you put your arms around the issue, you have to find ways to define what impact you are making. And I intentionally didn't use results because I think one needs to go one step beyond. This is very difficult, it's very challenging, but I think that is the only way that we'll get to a real holistic perspective of a new UN in which we go into a virtuous circle that impact then inspires people and people get more engaged and more driven by the needs of the people on the planet then are more issue-centric and deliver more impact. And that is what I see, a virtuous circle that will really change the way the organization works. To me, 
this is what fit for purpose means. And I think to do that, you need a real leader that has the courage to lead. And this is, I use the word courage there with very, very important and intentional purposes. Because to do this, to work in this way, you have to be ready to break the silos that people talk so much about. And you can only do that with courage. You can only do that if you are ready to lead. And this is the truth inside the house, but it's also the truth with member states, with the issues at hand outside the house. So the first thing is the courage to lead. The second thing is the humility to listen. I also believe that in this day and age, where the issues at hand are so complex, and I will come back to those issues in a second, you need to listen to all. And then, having listened to all, you need to have the courage to take the decisions. And once you take the decisions, you run with it. And the last thing you have to have is the readiness to partner. Because there is not single organization not even the United Nations, that can address the issues at hand. So you need to find a way to partner with whomever is best placed to deliver those solutions that you have designed based on the needs of the people. So it's a holistic approach, a different way to lead and to manage the organization. I believe that one of the things that we are facing these days a profound, is a profound lack of trust. And this is, to me, a major issue to, to handle as the next Secretary General comes on board. And there is a lack of trust in many dimensions. There is a lack of trust between the peoples and their leadership all over the world. So that goes beyond the United Nations, but feeds into the issues this organization needs to handle. There is a profound lack of trust among member states. And that is especially true in certain uh, situations between certain very, very important member states. There is also lack of trust between member states and the United Nations which is very, very worrisome, because if the trust is not there, what can this organization do to deliver from the high moral ground that it's supposed to have and be <coughs> embraced by the member states moving forward? There is also lack of trust within the house. So the notion of Building or rebuilding trust is another element that I think needs to be worked on and needs to be built on. And in my view, one of the most important decisions that member states will have to take when appointing the next Secretary General is to agree to a compact of trust at least for a certain period of time, to say we entrust this new Secretary General and we trust him or her, and I hope it's her, with the instruments to go for what is needed and to deliver what is needed. So all these pieces have to come together. And as I said, for me, the, the way you bring on board all these components is critical to set the stage on, on a new face of the United Nations that needs to handle very different issues. And let me talk a bit about the, the issues. First, needs to handle issues that essentially transcend borders. 
most of the questions we discussed today transcend borders. So how do you handle those issues in an organization that is a coalition of member states that is based on the principle of so the sovereign space of member states? And that goes back to trust, because in order to work on those issues that transcend borders, you need to be able to build on the trust that member states have towards the organization, but also the trust that member states should have among themselves or between themselves. And this is true to the question of terrorism, extremism, violent extremism. It is true to the question of climate change. You know, No single country in the world, not even this one, the most powerful one, can solve climate change on its own, even if it wanted. It's true to pandemics. You know, we saw it in Ebola. You know, something started very far from here in a little village in West Africa. It was not recognized. It mounted. And it ended up with the staff of the United Nations being requested to leave a bus because somebody had listened that she had just come back from Sierra Leone. This is how close, how little the world is how interconnected we are. So migration is another question that clearly is, goes beyond borders. All the issues that are at the front page of the newspapers of the world, what a, an acronym, you know, that are in, in, in media, in social media, most people don't read the front page of the newspapers any longer. Um, all those issues require a different way of approaching the solutions, both from this organization, but also from the members of this organization, per se. And I think, again, talking about the leadership style, that brings to bear the need of a leader, a secretary general, that is ready to build bridges, is ready to have his or her doors open to hear all the alternatives, is ready to use the good offices to the, lim the limit that is possible, that is ready to stick his neck out to take risk. Because there is not easy solution to any of these issues. There is not cookie cutter approach to any of these problems. And I have seen time and again the organization trying to use cookie cutter approaches. And that is not going to work. So creativity, readiness to reach out, readiness to listen, readiness to take a risk that is a reasonable risk so that we get back to the notion of delivering for the people who are in need. To me, this is how you bring the organization to the level that is required at this moment. To me, this is the opportunity to be foundational in the approach of reconvening all member states around this organization and trying to rebuild the trust that probably has gone away to a certain extent, and to prove that it's worthy by really delivering impact. I deeply believe that is, this is possible. I think it's, it's, there is a desperate need to evolve into that. I don't believe in revolutions, but I think there is a strong need of an evolution in this way, and I think I can do it. So I, I hope this will resonate with the member states. I hope this will resonate with the members of the Security Council. Then most importantly, I hope it will resonate with you all this morning and we'll have the opportunity to have a good exchange. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, your views and your visions uh, on the UN today and uh, tomorrow. Uh, I thought, or I think everybody would agree me with me, that you spoke with clarity and that you were extremely candid in your presentation. And I think what penetrates our minds in, in, in substance uh, from uh, what you stated is that you are calling for courageous and creative leadership. And that you also put an enormous emphasis on trust and confidence, a compact of trust, you stated, um, and that this will be the um, uh, leading, uh, I was about to say, sees uh, courageous, creative uh, uh, um, stars for your leadership of the United Nations. But I'm sure now that the audience um, and other participants uh, would like to ask you questions about how you're going to implement those crucial values which you outlined. So with these words, I would like to open, to open the floor. Do I see any, uh, any hands for questions? This is a unique opportunity. Uh, we have one of the front runners for being the next Secretary General amongst us for now, I think, 45 minutes. Uh, I saw a hand over there, please. Um, take the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm Richard Bennett with Amnesty International. Um, thanks, Ms. Meskov Melkora, for um, emphasizing uh, very clearly the issue of trust and the issue of the organization being issues driven. Um, Sometimes my perception on both of these is that, and I think it's not perhaps, it's perhaps somewhat shared, is that the organization um, gets too much involved in crisis management, uh, particularly uh, within the office of uh, the Sec Secretary General. How would you move the organization ahead of the curve? Not just to deal with the crisis when it happens, but to anticipate the crisis. I don't, I mean, uh, Ebola is an example you gave. I'm not sure how you would handle that differently. Um, but let me give you another example. Uh, uh, some weeks ago, um, the Secretary General came under enormous pressure to remove Saudi Arabia uh, from a list of countries um, abusing uh, children in armed conflict. Um, I'm not gonna ask you whether the current SG made the right decision in that case, because that would be unfair. What I'm gonna ask you is, if you were Secretary General, what steps would you take to avoid getting in that situation in the first place? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was actually not only one question, it was a series of questions, and I think some of them might require a fairly comprehensive, a fairly comprehensive answer. I'd actually plan to have several take the floor before I turn it over to you again, Susanna. But this was so comprehensive, I think I would give you the floor right away. So I go with this one now? Yeah. OK. First of all, I couldn't agree more with you that uh, the organization is essentially a, driven by crisis. And having been in the 38th floor for almost four years, I can tell you that you were working on the crisis of the day, sometimes on the crisis of the morning. And sometimes crises were uh, big and were known to the external world. Sometimes were small crises that probably did not transpire to the external world, but they still were crises. To me, what is fundamental is to engage ahead of time in conversations within the United Nations, and by this I mean the system at large. I think the Secretary General has is duty bound to, to manage not only what is directly in, in, under his purview, or his or her purview, but also the larger system. And this goes to the point of Ebola, you know. One needs to have a systematic approach to early warning. And this has to be done through an exercise that is it's a simple exercise, but it's a cabinet-like exercise where you meet with certain frequency and you discuss the matters that are in the horizon in different areas. And in the case of Ebola, it would have been in the, in the area of WHO. So there has to be a way to activate what the CEB is 
in a manner that is more geared towards detecting the early signs of trouble. And these are not only a peace and security issues. It's, it's a broader question, and, and again, the Ebola example it was one of them. So for me, how to activate the model of the CEB in, in a more uh, results-oriented and early warning uh, manner is, is, a, is a tool that the Secretary General is entitled to use and should be used to ameliorate some of the impacts of, of the coming crisis in your way. On the question that the specific question you raised about Saudi Arabia, I, I was not privy to any of the details, so I, in fact, I will not comment, as you said, on what was done. But what I think is needed, and I've seen this happen in the past with that very same report, which, I, as you know, is a very tricky report because everybody feels that uh, is the, the, the naming and shaming is, is very bad. So whenever uh, uh, there is a hint that an organization or, or a, a, a member state may be included, generates a lot of heat. So for me, the principle of no surprise is fundamental. If there is a problem, and, and again, I'm not assuming here that that's the case with Saudi Arabia. I don't know. I was not involved. But with any case, if you get the early signs of a problem of the nature that that report is going to, to represent, you have, and that to me is the duty of the Secretary General trying to avoid crisis, you have to engage with that, particularly if it is a member state, and say, listen, this is what we are seeing, this is what we, because in, in signaling earlier on, I think the most likely situation is that there will be a course correction by that member state. And in the end, that's what we want. We don't want to have a report that signals. We want a reality that is not a, a misuse or mishandle. So in my view, that is something that we have to improve. And I think, and, and I'm not naive, I know this is easier said than done. And I, don't, I know sometimes it's being done at a certain level and it doesn't trickle up. And that's why I think in certain critical issues like human rights abuses or like the one in the report of children in armed conflict, there is a need of a very high involvement. Because that's one way of handling this, this responsibility of good offices. And my sense is that there is a, a need for an investment of time and dedication to those matters to avoid the crisis, which may not be avoided in the end, but at least if you have given enough heads up, you are in the position to say no surprises. I think uh, I'm tempted to, to comment uh, and ask you a question before I give the floor uh, to uh, others here. Uh, uh, of course, you, you, the UN Secretary General carries many roles, and two of the main roles is that uh, he or she is the uh, secular pope uh, of the world and wears the meter of the pope and uh, points fingers uh, based on moral values and the values of, of the charter. But the other one is that uh, he or she is also a political prince or princess wearing the crown uh, uh, of uh, royalty being the foremost diplomat of the world. So reading b between the lines in, in what you said, uh, am I correct to say that what you are calling for is that when you have uh, a crisis, which was just illustrated, that you will say, let's first try silent diplomacy, being uh, the political prince or princess, engaging with the leaders of a country or a group or an organization, and see if we can try to find a solution. Instead of first going into public diplomacy and finger pointing, basically, I think what if I'm correct, what you implied is that that often can harden the position of your client, so to speak, uh, so that you would like to try to find a discrete political solution first, and then if it doesn't work, you might use the finger pointing. Is this correct? Well, I mean, you have framed it in a manner that was different than what I had in mind, but I, I think it's, it's a fair way to frame it. I, essentially, what I think is fundamental is that 
the United Nations needs to address and solve the issues. And in my view, using the, the, the front page, I'm going back to my old front page uh, uh, explanation, the front page of the New York Times is not necessarily helpful as a first resort. I think having the courage to use it, if needed, is very important. But you have to build your case throughout time eh, by reaching out to the ones who are involved and, and being very blunt and very clear. Eh, what I have learned in my eh, more than 10 years in the United Nations is that when you reach out and you make your case, the likelihood of some course correction is high. It's not 100%. There are outliers there. <coughs> But there is a, a, a likelihood of, of a chance of course correcting. Maybe not be perfect, and maybe may require a second or a third round. So the investment on, on that type of intervention for me is fundamental. But that does not mean, and let me be clear here, that you are not going to use your red car if needed. You must be ready to use it, and your, the others must be totally aware that you will be ready to use it, because that's part of the strength you have. And if you prove that if there is a, a willingness to correct, if there is a willingness to engage, if there is a willingness to change, you will not get into your red car. I think that creates, again, a, a very interesting dynamics between actors, most of them member states, but not always member states, and the United Nations, which is, in my view, conducive to solving the issues, but also is conducive to creating this circle of trust, which I referred to when I was talking earlier. Thank you very much, clear and uh, candid as your intervention. Now I can see many hands here, so let's move again. Uh, first, please, can you state your name and affiliation? Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Malcora. Edith Lettereff from the Associated Press. I was wondering if you could comment on the relatively poor showing of women in the first straw poll. Arena Bokova came third, uh, Helen Clark came sixth, you came seventh, and the other three women were below that. Um, is there some thought that you had of why this happened? And uh, what are you personally um, doing to try and improve your results? Thank you. So we take uh, one more question before I go back to Susanna. Please go ahead. Name and, name and affiliation, please. Good morning. Christina Thiessen from Mennonite Central Committee. My question concerns the cholera epidemic in Haiti that was introduced by UN peacekeepers in 2010. When this question was raised in your informal dialogue at the General Assembly, you noted that um, this is a difficult question to answer because you're not privy to the ongoing legal process. Numerous civil society groups and many of your fellow candidates for Secretary General share the view that regardless of the legal process, this is an issue that requires action by the UN to ensure that cholera is eradicated and victims have access to remedies. Given your role as former chef de cabinet and head of the Department of Field Support, you are probably the candidate most familiar with this issue. Therefore, my question for you is, what is your position on how the UN should respond to this issue out of court? Thank you. Thank you very much. Then, uh, if you would agree, Susanna, we'll take one more question, and then, we'll, then I will come back to you. Uh, do I see, a, I see a hand at the very back? And I know that's a very special hand. So, Hillary. Hi, thank you. Um, as you know, we have many people following along online. And so if I may ask you actually two questions that we've received from Facebook, one from the United Kingdom and one from Pakistan. First question is regarding uh, internships at the UN. It says, do you believe that UN interns who do valuable work should be paid a living stipend so that all people, including from poor backgrounds and from the global south, can access these valuable opportunities? 
The second question asks for your take on the Kashmir dispute and what role you would play in resolving this between India and Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you. Um, I was surprised with the initial results of the, the, the straw poll. Um, I, was, I was surprised because I think, and, and putting myself aside, I think there are colleagues there that um, have a, a, an experience, a track record that uh, deserves a higher consideration. To be to be candid, but um, I also know that. Thank you. Thank you. I also know that this first straw poll is um, is just a very tactical first voting. So I I have strong hopes that the view of of, of women representing or having options to represent. Uh, the United Nations as Secretary General will be taken higher in consideration as things move forward. Um, my sense is that everybody is now reading the tea leaves and is, is looking into what is going to happen next. So what am I doing? First, what the first thing I did is I convey a message the very same day, thanking the ones who have voted for me and saying I'm going to work hard to persuade the ones who haven't yet found me a, a, the right person. So that's what I'm doing. I'm working hard. I'm conveying the message. And I think um, uh, that will hopefully uh, uh, yield results. I think that there is a, a great opportunity for the Security Council members to read into the tea leaves and decide on the way forward. And there will be quite a few other straw polls that I'm sure Will, will show a, an evolution in the results, but it's in their hands. And the only thing we can do as candidates is make our case. On cholera, first I wasn't asked in the, in the informal uh, dialogue. I was asked by the press after leaving the informal dialogue, just, just to, to be precise. And um, I will be very respectful, and I will continue to say that while this is in, in the hands of of the court, one needs to be very careful in talking about a court case. Having said that, you refer to the responsibility and the need for cholera to be eradicated. I couldn't agree more with you. I think the United Nations has a duty to work very, very closely uh, with the government in Haiti and with all institutions, particularly NGOs in Haiti, to improve the, the sanitary system in Haiti to improve the conditions of health in Haiti to uh, get to the point where cholera is fully eradicated. I, I agree with that. I also agree that one needs to work with the families to give them an opportunity to, to move forward and to, again, uh, be part of the solution to the cholera eradication. But I will not comment, and I will be responsible from, from me to comment on the legal case, precisely because I have had, I have been privy to part of the information, so it will not be the right thing for me to do. I believe in the responsibility of the UN to work on the cholera eradication. I think there is a lot to do, but there also there is also a lot that has been done, and we need to continue to work in that regard. Um, the question on internships, you know. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting because it's true that the internships are essentially a bias towards the North. And that's the case because they are not paid. And the Northern youngsters have more opportunity to go for it without being paid than the ones coming from the South. So definitely part of the bias is the question of unpaid internships. This is something that we have to discuss clearly with member states, because it's not a decision of the Secretary General to go for paid internships. I, I think it's clear that using interns, and we know how we use them very actively, and sometimes interns produce much more than people who are full-time workers in the UN. So we have to recognize that, but we have to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation in the GA, in the Fifth Committee, on how we handle this. 
because this is also part of, of a, a extending yourself with cheap labor, which is something that is not right for the United Nations to use. So it's a deep, deep conversation to be held with the member states, with Fifth Committee, and I think one needs to admit that the UN cannot hire people, use them for full-time work, not for internship as such, and not pay, and that this, again, uh, yields an imbalance north-south that is absolutely against the geographic representation that is something that the UN should be proud of and should practice in all its decisions. So uh, I will have that discussion with, with the membership. Uh, I'm not sure how that discussion will end because uh, often a uh, membership is, is very um, um, uh, reluctant to increase the pay payroll in any shape or form, but we need to have it. And I think if we don't fix it, then we need to relook at what we do and how we use interns. The Kashmir dispute, well, this is a long lasting dispute. You know, it's one of the oldest disputes that uh, the UN oversees. We have a, 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 a mission there. And I think this is one of the cases where probably there is an opportunity for the Secretary General to have quiet conversations with both sides and look at the issue and see whether in the context of the world we have today and the challenges we have today, whether there is an opportunity to open up from both sides and explore solutions. That will be the only thing I could say right now. Thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, I will then once again open the floor. Do I see any hands? I do. The gentleman on the right by the wall there, please. And please name and affiliation. Hola, buenos días, señora Susana. It's my pleasure to see you again. My name is Carlos. I'm the coordination officer in Venezuela. Um, it has been 70 years since UN was created. Many things have changed. And I think that one of these uh, would be the relation of the UN with civil society and regular people. Couple of evidence. Last year, we asked people how the world they want, how, what's the world they wanted. Mm -hmm. And recently, regular people may participate in the public part of the process of the election of the Secretary General. Based on this, if you were the Secretary General, how would you manage the expectation created in regular people on the role of the UN? Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else who wants to take the floor at this point? Uh, then, Susanna, I will go straight back to you. You have the floor again. Susanna. Either I yeah. have answered all the questions. I think there is one question. Oh, right there is one more. Uh, Ian Martin, Security Council report. Um, Susanna, the issue of senior appointments has surfaced quite a lot in the hearings, and uh, you know better than anyone other than the Secretary General the extraordinary pressures that are applied by member states uh, uh, in relation to senior appointments, usually on behalf of men with government backgrounds, uh, and sometimes with very adverse consequences uh, in subsequent performance uh, when those pressures are successful. How would you handle or how would you advise whoever is the next Secretary General to handle the issue of uh, merit-based, uh, gender-sensitive senior appointments? Thank you. Um, any other hands at this stage? Remember, this is a unique opportunity. It might not come back again. I see another hand there. Hi, good morning. My name is Sabrina Stein. I work at the Conflict Prevention and Peace Forum. And my question is, if you became Secretary General, you would be taking leadership of the organization following a series of reviews that took place in 2015 and up to the World Humanitarian Summit this year. So how do you see your role uh, as in the leadership position of SG implementing these and following through with all of the recommendations that will be sitting at your desk when you arrive? Then please. 
The question of civil society is a very interesting question because I think one of the needs the United Nations has to really be recognized and to work on that trust issue that I referred to is relate to common people better. But one must not forget that the United Nations is still and remains an organization of member states. And the other thing I like to remember, and I say this very often and people laugh, is that as much as many believe that the Secretary General is the president of the United Nations of the world, that is not the case. And, and it is for member states to, to allow this opening to the participation of civil society and, and, and the outreach to, to common people. My sense is that we have come a long way. When you look at the events in the United Nations, you see the presence of civil society to a level that was unprecedented 10 years ago, even five years ago. Is it enough? Are we doing it well enough? I think there is room for improvement, but this is an organization that evolves on continuous basis. And in the end, it's for member states to agree. You know, there is a, a, a committee that allows a NGOs to join. So there is a process there, which I think has allowed for a much more open and engaged a, a discussion within the UN premises. But I think the reality of the world today requires more. And by the way, I think this takes me to the question of communications by the United Nations and how we are able to translate the United Nations that takes place in the halls here in New York to what people need on the ground. I think what was decided last year on Agenda 2030 is absolutely amazing. It's, it's a shift in the way member states see their role and their responsibility towards a more inclusive society, towards equal opportunity, towards a sustainable development is amazing. How do we translate that to people, not only in what we do, what governments do, and now I have the responsibility being on the other side of the table to implement, not only on what governments do to implement, but also to translate that huge, huge document into tangibles so that people can absorb them. And that is one of the biggest uh, uh, issues we have at hand, how to translate. And it's not only how to translate in many languages, it's how to translate in many cultures. So uh, my sense is that we have come a long way on engagement of civil society. In fact, the input into that agenda is an example. But we still need to find a way to retrofit and make sure that what we do here has meaning to the people, so people feel that the organization is worth it, and it's theirs. That's part of building this trust compact that I, I was referring to. Um, senior appointments. Uh, uh, and this is um, a very hard question, and it's, it's, it's very difficult, and it's something that I have discussed with member states throughout these deliberations and with my meeting with the Security Council. First of all, it, I think that we, we need to talk about senior leadership teams. I, and this is particularly true when we talk about senior leadership in missions. But it's also true here. You need to put together teams that complement each other. In the case of missions, the complexity of managing a mission, the having the political uh, uh, experience, the ability to, to deal with the political issues, but at the same time manage people and manage resources to the tone of 1 billion, 1.2 billion, and, and you know, thousands of people, is, is very hard. Often we ask for people to be either Wonder Woman or Superman. So we need to be able to put together teams that complement each other and can secure a, a, a capacity to have a holistic view. And I said this is particularly true in missions. So 
that's the first thing, to put together teams. The second thing is to ask member states for women. That's one thing that I have uh, uh, been very frustrated having dealt with this issue. Systematically, you do not receive names of women as, as options for, for the selection, you know. And you can only go so far if member states don't, don't provide that. So I think one of the uh, questions that I will raise with member states is that there will be preference to their suggestions if there are female candidates in their list. The other thing is not to put one name forward only. Because if you think about putting together teams, somebody may be perfect, but it may not fit in a team. And that's only fair. And that's, so I, I think we have to work, again, in an en engaged manner with member states, saying, we listen to your request, but please, we have to take into account the gender balance that, by the way, you ask from us when we go to the General Assembly, and also the geographic balance, because that's the other point. Putting together teams should allow to both balances to improve. And my, my, I will say, if I were to be selected, that will be my first priority, to organize my initial team with this spirit. And I think if we do it right, and that goes back to the compact question, if member states trust and entrust the Secretary General enough, he or she should be able to work in this manner and deliver on, on, on good professional teams that comply with all the requests that the, the, the charter has uh, included. That again shows how wise the founding members were because everything is there, including senior appointments. We just have to live to the spirit of, up to the spirit of the charter. Regarding reviews, uh, I mean, I, I think that the work done through the different panels is, is very uh, important. I think that uh, there is a number of recommendations that need to be implemented. I will say to you, there are others that I will look into it uh, with the FinCom. One of the things I find in the United Nations that often we try to address the problem of something not working by adding a layer, by overlapping a new structure. And my take on that is exactly the opposite. That's why I talk so much about issue-centric solutions. I think you need to, if anything, define what is needed and then work around that with whichever tools the house has. So I will look into the matter with, with total priority because it's, it's definitely needed, but I will not, uh, in a, in, you know, as a principle, embrace everything that has been recommended. Thank you. Um, any other questions at this stage? Uh, we have now 15 minutes, actually 14, I think, minutes left because uh, the foreign minister will have to uh, leave for another important meeting. So I can see many hands coming up here now, and can I please then ask uh, you to be as short as possible when you pose your questions. Uh, may I start with the lady on my left over there? Thank you so much, Ms. Malcora, a uh, big fan of yours. También soy Argentina. Uh, <laughs> So I would like to ask you, as a South American um, uh, studying international affairs at University of California, San Diego, and interning at the Department of Political Affairs at the UN, um, hypothetically, um, in the case that Venezuela, that the regime, there was, let's say, that it collapsed, hypothetically, how would you go about trying to address the issue and stabilizing um, a situation like that. Please. Thank you. Um, we will take two more questions in this uh, group. Uh, there is a gentleman in the mid row there. Uh, thank you. Uh, George Baumgarten, uh, UN correspondent for Jewish newspapers in North America, as well as for some 
African and East African and Pan-African publications. Uh, with the recent spate of violent outbreaks and extremist acts all over Europe, even within the United States and elsewhere, I find myself uh, repeatedly drawn to the old lines from William Butler Yeats, which go, things, uh, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, uh, the best lack all conviction, but the worst are filled with passionate intensity. I hope you won't find this overly broad, but what effect do you think the UN can uh, have in this increasingly, recently, very much increasingly violent world, and what would you do on day one uh, to combat this if elected? Thank you. I've now closed my list. I will take one more question, and then uh, the foreign minister will have uh, the last word. Uh, I saw a hand there. Uh, it's, it's a very well-known face, but uh, John, you have the floor. John Hirsch, IPI. Thank you so. Thank you for your remarks today. I have to be very brief. What? How do you envisage your role in the prevention of genocide? Your three predecessors, who had good intentions were not able to stop either the genocide in Rwanda or in Srebrenica. And there was not even the ability in the Security Council to commemorate the victims of the Srebrenica genocide. So how would you approach this matter differently from your predecessors? Thank you very much. Then, Susanna, famous last words. Well, first of all, in, in the case of Venezuela, you know, there is a, a very strong engagement by the region to encourage the government and the opposition to dialogue. The signals we are getting are that probably that will come to bear soon. We feel very, very strongly that this should be the way. Um, it's, it's very interesting because uh, um, the government has been voted by the people. So this is a government elected through democratic means as much as the opposition was voted by the people. And this is a, something that is a pattern that is happening in our region, but beyond our region, that people start to say, you know, I do not give full power to anybody. You just fix this and get together and sort it out. So for us, what is fundamental now is that that dialogue takes place, that dialogue addresses all the issues at hand. There are different levels of crisis. There is a political crisis. There is an, an, a, a, an economic crisis. But there is also this, this need to solve the short-term uh, basic needs of the people. So to, for us, that's what needs to happen. We are very engaged in that, supporting the dialogue through the different tools that the, the region has. And uh, I don't see. As, as of now, a situation of, of the government imploding or exploding. And I think we also need to remember that this is a, a, a country that has all the tools that all the institutions that the, 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 their system allows. So I will follow very closely, and, and I think there is a, a, a high opportunity that they will find a way forward that is a, solves and addresses the need of the people. Um, the question on, on extremist, extre, extremist acts, you know, this goes to the heart of the trust that I was talking to. It's, it's clear that there is a gap between what people expect and what they are getting. It's also clear that there are some uh, masterminds behind these trying to connect these dots and create chaos, trying to create a sense that the freedom that we all value so much is not a something that should be uh, there. Because the, the worst that uh, is left behind these acts of horror is the fact that people feel more and more uh, under threat, feel more and more that they should not go to public uh, uh, games should not go to the uh, fireworks. I mean, this really tackles the heart of the values that we have and that this organization stands for. How do we tackle that? 
I honestly believe that there is not a silver bullet for that. I think mean, we need to work together, all member states, we need to go work together, uh, representatives of different faith, because the last thing we, we want is this to be associated to religion and be in religion space, it's not. And we need, and, and to, for me, this is the opportunity. This, this being so asymmetric, this being so beyond the boundaries of any particular member state, and being such a huge threat to all of us, is the opportunity for member states to decide to come together and rebuild that compact of trust that I was referring to. Because there are threats that go beyond the capacity that any of them can handle. So that is the thing I will, I will try and work on. <clears throat> Prevention of genocide. I think genocide has early warning signals. And that takes me back to what I said at the beginning. You know, we need to work on those signals and we need to use the, the whole set of institutions that the United Nations has to capture those signals. And once captured, bring them to the attention and going back to what Turner said, you can start by being a quiet messenger not to rock the boat unnecessarily, but if need be, you need to come out loud and early. That's the only way. Because when the genie is out of the box, it's very, very difficult to, to stop. So it's the combination of ha having the means within the United Nations to get those signals, because the presence that the UN has is, um, is not comparable to any other organization. But often, the signals don't get to the right place. So capturing those signals, conveying the message to the right places at a certain quiet level first, because you don't want to accelerate processes also, but also being ready to come out loud and you know, make the case, and make the case to the Security Council if need be, because that was the issue in some of the examples that you referred to. Uh, thank you, but before I thank you more extensively, let me remind you that uh, tomorrow, everybody I'm reminding, at 1 p.m. we will welcome the 10th candidate here at IPI, namely Christiana Fugueres of Costa Rica, and I hope that you all will be able to join us also then. Um, Susanna, I think you've been uh, terrific, and I must say I've appreciated enormously that you've given us such clear lines of guidance for what your leadership of the United Nations uh, will be. And I think uh, it's encapsulated in a few wor words, that's courage, creativity, confidence and trust, but also I think of equal importance of what you said is that you will be willing to take risks as a leader because you realize that without taking risk you can't make a change. So please join me in thanking and wishing good luck to the Foreign Minister of Argentina. Thank you. Thank you.